Hello, and welcome to The Genius of Music, the fourth episode of our Genius of series. I'm Hilary Viner, CEO of Genius 100 Foundation. On behalf of the extraordinary Genius 100 team, founder Rami Kleinman, Global Ambassador Ido Aharoni, Chief Community Officer Helen Hatzes, thank you so much for making the time to join us, either for the first time or again, for this very special Genius 100 Foundation event. We are delighted and honored to see so many Genius 100 visionaries, members of the Genius 100 community, honored guests, and students from so many places around the world, including, again, Ms. Golden's class from Palm Middle School in Los Angeles. They join us every time. And we want to give a special thank you to series sponsor BST Canada and Ala Tanous, founding member of our community and president of Genius 100 Foundation Canada for your generous support. Now on to today's extraordinary event. I think it's safe to say we all love music and it's truly our universal language. And every day, more and more, we all need something that we can all understand that moves us and lifts our spirits. According to Daniel Levitin, author of This Is Our Brain on Music, music is unique among human activities in terms of its ubiquity and antiquity. While conducting research on this subject, we discovered in the pages of his book that no known human culture, either now or in the recorded past, is devoid of music. Musical instruments are among the earliest physical artifacts discovered in human and proto-human excavation sites. For the majority of the world's population and for the majority of human history, music making was as natural as breathing and walking. So what exactly is music? Why do some songs move us so much and others don't? Where does creativity and music originate? And how do the great musicians and engineers have the uncanny ability to pick on sub subtleties that the majority of us miss? And why do some people find it so easy to compose music and others struggle? On that note, here's the rundown. I will try to briefly introduce G100 visionaries, Shuki Levy, Eduardo Martoret and Constantine Badigan, who are the subjects of today's series. Then I'll turn it over to Constantine to lead today's discussion. And here's where you come in. We will be fielding questions from the audience at the conclusion of the conversation. So please don't forget to submit your questions via the Q&A option located within your Zoom panel. At the conclusion of the Q&A, I'll be back to close things out and share some you heard it here first G100 special announcements. So without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our moderator and awe-inspiring panel. First, from Pasadena, California, we have Constantine Badigan. He's an American astronomer and a professor of planetary science at Caltech. He's also the co-founder of Planet Nine, a hypothetical planet on the outer region of the solar system and he's the lead guitarist and vocalist for the hard rock band, The Seventh Season. And through G100, maestro Eduardo Martoret was so inspired by Constantine's discovery, he composed a 12 minute piece called Planet Nine that was performed live by the Miami Symphony Orchestra with Constantine on the electric guitar and played for the first time last year live from the International Space Station for Genius 100 Visionary Induction Ceremony of astronaut Soichi Noguchi. And then we have Genius 100 visionary, Shuki Levy, based in Los Angeles. He's an award-winning composer, songwriter, recording and performing artist who has garnered 15 gold and platinum records with sales in excess of 14 million records worldwide. He has scored over a dozen feature and television films, composed music for over 130 television shows, and produced, written, and directed multiple film and television projects. He has also composed over 100 memorable television theme songs, including Inspector Gadget, He-Man, The Masters of the Universe, Spider-Man, and X-Men. He holds the world record for composing the most television theme songs. He's a self-taught musician and mastered the guitar by the age of 14 and founded one of Israel's first rock groups. And then from Miami, we have my dear friend, Maestro Eduardo Martoret, music director and composer of the Miami Symphony Orchestra, which just closed its 33rd season earlier this month under Maestro's baton for the past 16 years. 
Inducted as a Genius 100 visionary in 2019, his vision statement states that music is a powerful unifying tool as stones and crystals are powerful healer and has integrated the golden ratio, also known as the Fabinucci sequence into his musical compositions. Our maestro, as I call him, is the Genius 100 visionary charged with orchestrating the music for our annual visionary ceremony and is hard at work preparing for the induction ceremony of our 2022 G100 visionary, Goldie Hawn, taking place on May 31st. So that's all from me for now. So Constantine, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Hillary. And uh, let's see, it says I'm unable to start a video because the host has stopped it. It might be to some extent better this way uh, or, ah, never mind. Here I am. Okay, here I am in two dimensions. Uh, I can see Eduardo has joined. I think uh, Shuki is going to join uh, on in, again in 2D real quick. Um, it's a it's a real pleasure to be speaking with both of you, uh, all of you today, um, and you know we I think it's you know still a continuing sign of the times that we get to do this uh, you know in kind of remotely, uh, and we're doing the best we can, of course. Um, and last time we hung out right in in three dimensions was right before the start of the pandemic right and i remember um you know listening shuki to you uh talk a little bit about your process of writing music and something you mentioned right is that you don't take credit for the for the compositions that you write that you are merely a conduit for this music that comes from elsewhere right and it's sort of channeled through you to become uh, you know, something, something external. And today, you know, I was kind of inspired by that. So today we're going to play a game where I'm also going to be a conduit, but not for, uh, you know, something godly, but something, uh, you know, ungodly, namely an artificial intelligence. So what I've done in preparation for this, I've had a, an artificially, you know, a natural language algorithm uh, create the questions, or at least a fraction of the questions, and we'll see you know, if our uh, if our viewers are going to be figure able to figure out what questions have been written by an AI and what questions have been written by uh, by a human, so you know this will be nice because you are a conduit for something external. I'm just a conduit for a soulless algorithm that is uh, that is going to be speaking through to you both through me. So to get things going, right? The first obvious question that I think we need to address, right, to lay the foundation for this conversation is what exactly is music to you, right? Why does it, why do songs, why do some songs move us so much while others don't, right? What is the, what is the secret key? And I don't need to like talk about, you know, music as a combination of notes, right? What is music more fundamentally? Shuki, what do you think? I think it's a language, a language of the soul, actually, and mm -hmm. a universal one that every human can understand and connect to. Okay, okay. And, you know, to sort of follow up on, on this, if, uh, on this notion of the language, right? What do you think is the role of the kind of the musical artist that the musical artist plays in society, right? We can imagine an alternative world where, where music does not exist, right? And we can imagine a world where, you know, things function, crops grow, right? We eat, we go to work, whatever, right? So what is, what is the role music plays? What do you think? Uh, I think that if a composer creates uh, a new piece of music and it truly really comes from his heart, it's, it's, it's filled with nothing but the truth about mm -hmm. how he feels about that specific subject matter that he's composing for. And 
from that point on, if all those ingredients are there, the same feeling that he himself will feel will be felt all over the world by other people without them even knowing what the man or the woman look like, mm -hmm. just by connecting to something that started from a really organic and truthful place. Okay, okay. So you think that a music, an effect, is a way to, to add authenticity uh, into, into our life that would not otherwise be there. Exactly. I'm really, yeah. On, on the, I'm sorry to interrupt, but on the other hand, if a composer just does it like a robot, uh -huh. like your AI guy will do, <laughs> uh -huh. and it doesn't come from the soul, it could be super commercial. It could be like an overnight hit all over the world. That's not going to last much longer because it doesn't contain mm -hmm. those, those elements that are elements of nature, of, of, of reality. Interesting. Interesting. Um, let's see. It says, uh, I can see, uh, I really want to keep going on this theme of authenticity because this is something that Eduardo has uh, has talked to me quite a bit about a, you know around a year ago. I can see that Eduardo is muted and uh, and cannot un unmute himself. My uh, you cannot be muted. <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah, um, so we will come back. Oh, yeah. oh here yeah. you are. Okay, perfect. So this is really something that uh, you know is serendipitous because I remember um, when Eduardo when you wrote the music, right, for Planet Nine. And I remember learning it, right? And, and it, was, it was too fast for me to play, at least initially, right? I remember just, you know, that frustrating feeling of just find, realizing that my fingers don't move that fast. Um, you know, and, and you said something uh, to me that was, that was remarkable. I remember uh, it, it, you know, as if it was a moment ago, you said that the most important thing is to not play all the right notes in exactly the way that it's written, but the most important thing is to play them in a way that will make it authentic, right? That remember we were talking on the phone, and so what does what does that mean to you, right? Because ultimately, right, there's there's music, there's that language written down, right? What does it mean to play it in an authentic way? Well. It's very interesting you mentioned this because I was trying to persuade you to be to relax and to and not be stressed by that. So in a way, I was kind of uh, being a bit flexible with my my feelings because of, of course you have to pay the right notes. Okay. No, I'm sorry, I couldn't. I'm sorry, no, I couldn't. <laughs> no, but but if you couldn't, then I had to give you the freedom to play whatever. And being the composer, I had the authority to. You know, for you to do it, but if you were playing something by Beethoven, it would have been more difficult because, you know, I would have to ask him if he would have, he would have been happy with it. Mind you, uh, interpretation, which is all about when we were performing, is again something which is very subjective, as we're all saying here. And uh, you have to give yourself the freedom. And in fact, you could hear a classical piece being performed, not exactly as written. Mm -hmm. because the performer gives herself or himself certain flexibilities. So, yes, but in your case, I really tried to, to make you relax, and you did. You, you played not all the notes. You played, played them magnificently. You were really, yes, Constantine, I was so proud of you. And uh, I know I wrote something rather difficult because, again, I wasn't writing it only for you. I was writing it for the universe. As, as Shuki said, we, we, uh, we have no choice. We write what comes through us, and that's it. If we become that conscious, then what we write is has no emotion, right, Chucky? It, it is, right. It's better not to do it. That's right. We are only like a vehicle for from the uh -huh. universe to, to do whatever we have to do, and that's why it, it is it is very valid, and people love it. And that's right. actually, I'd say, the difference between a music that really gets to you, touches you, and a music that doesn't you, because one is live. And then the other one is well, artificial, yes. whatever you want to call it. 
Okay. Um, so yeah, so let's pick up on this because I'm curious about your thought thoughts on the role that you know technology is playing in music because right it's obvious as you both said right it has you know it is the foundation of all edm right uh but you know has it changed the way that you compose right i mean and i think that this is as much uh, of a question for you shuke as it is for you eduardo because right has it has the process of composing classical like music been altered by technology um i i don't let technology alter anything mm -hmm. uh, and speaking of playing the right notes i'm not a great musician at all i cannot sit and, and play you a frank sinatra song you know i can try when i'm by myself but you better not hear it <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I play my own music very well because somehow I can express on the instrument what, what I'm hearing. Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, there's no such thing as it's the right note or not. It's, it's how every note makes me feel. And then from there, mm -hmm. it goes on to, I went as far as recording and doing the arrangements for 120 musicians of the Moscow Symphony Orchestra to record an album. And I spent a couple of months over there recording it, but it was all translated by a conductor who actually wrote down the notes because I cannot write, read and write music, but I could, I, I could play every instrument and the part of every instrument. And my conductor will ask me, how did you know that this is the limit as far as the trumpet goes, and it should change to harmony. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's, it's just... <laughs> right. I just, I put down what I hear, and it mm -hmm. happens to be in line okay. with what you know. And Right. Well, I know for a fact, Eduardo, that you know how to read and write music. Uh, and so what, how, how has it been for you, right? Has, has MIDI uh, changed the way you compose? Has, you know, I don't know, like being able to have an AI drummer change the way you compose or, or not so much? Are they just, you know, tools that you rely on in the same way as writing with a pen as, a pen, as opposed to a pencil? Yes, I, I'm the same as Shukir. I don't let the technology control my my creativity at all mm. in fact i have a great apprehension for example for the click track mm -hmm. which i think has been the evil uh, of modern music because uh, you know we talked about that you know i know you see you love it constantly because we discussed this why because it you see the beauty of our performance is the flexibility of tempo mm -hmm. click track gives you a tempo, like the metronome gives you a tempo. Mm -hmm. And by that, the tempo should be only be a reference, not an imposition. And for, in recording studios for many years now, we have used the click track as a, not only a reference, but like the conductor who simply commands where to go. What happens with that, the result is that everybody's like a slave of that situation. And that kills the flexibility of music, which is what actually the soul gets. Because the mind only detects uh, things when changed. When things are similar, your mind doesn't connect with right. it. It connects when things are different. And that's the beauty of it all. So in technology, although the click track is one of the very basic technological right. items, it is a devil. And besides that, I use all the others very, very freely. and. Right. Um, I'm very glad you mentioned about reading because I learned to read music when I was 18 years old. I feel, I sympathize very much with, with Shuki. And uh, I think it's so beautiful, it's so poetic to find someone as famous, as successful as Shuki, that is like giving a lesson to the world. You can't do anything. You don't have to really know it to, to, the, to the death of what people expect you should know it. If you have the inspiration, go for it. Go for it, and you will be a winner. And that's Shuki's example. I love it. You well, it, it, I follow Einstein.
times a lot, as you can tell. And he said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Exactly. It's fabulous. That's it. Yeah. It's yeah. so inspiring. It's, it's, you know. You know, and, and actually to the point of, uh, to the point of notation, right? The <laughs> Einstein uh, did not do the theory of general relativity in existing notation. He created his own way to write it down, right? Exactly. Which is the equivalent of the mathematical equivalent of saying, I don't like the existing structure, right? It's still going to say, this is still going to be perfectly self consistent and follow all of the right. rules of reality. I'm just going to think about it my own way. So it's, it's a really fantastic um, connection. Um, and I want to extend it to the role of the listener because, uh, for, you know, I'm not, I'm like 10 to the minus six, maybe a billionth of, of the musician that I, uh, either of you are. But one of the things that I really resonate with when we play live is the fact that the, the listener, right, the audience is actually really part of the performance, right? The way that we play and it just goes down to basic things like tempo, right? I feel like tempo is in part controlled by the energy of the of the audience when we play, right? Yeah, exactly. and, yeah right. The, the the entire thing is a is like a resonance. The other, it's like a communication on some higher, you know, level that is that is invisible. So, right, given that we, I think, all agree that this is a you know this is all a real effect why what do you think that is right why is it why is it the case that you can not only you know channel your own creativity but be in real time inspired by those that are that are listening right have you i'm sure both of you have thought quite a bit about this and like what do you think about this uh, i think like any other form of communication Mm -hmm. it's it's not just about the energy that you project your the energy that you project affects and ignites a similar mm -hmm. kind of positive energy that comes back to you when it comes back to you it makes you better at at carrying on this this exchange of energy uh, so with the live audience it's almost like instant karma. Mm -hmm. You get it. You get it immediately, and it feeds everybody involved. And there's no beginning or an end. It's like a circle of energy that goes around. Uh, the performer feels it and loves it, and then the audience are loving it because they feel it. I will add to that, which I totally agree, to be in a more kind of scientific, precise way, is that we all vibrate in a similar frequency when we play music. Right. The, the audience doesn't, is not playing it, but they are vibrating with us. Mm -hmm. So the same frequency connects all of us. That's right. The frequency, which of course is multiple because it's just not a 440 Hertz. No, it's a frequency. In fact, maybe as a matter of fact, how it's, this is maybe a frequency we haven't yet discovered. Of right? Like, like planet nine. Most likely, <laughs> most likely. Oh, yeah. Yes, we are exactly. far, far, far from discovering everything. Exactly, exactly. Ever. <laughs> Very interesting. This, this is fabulous. I'm so glad. We're creating this at, in this, at the moment. Fabulous. Well, so speaking of the discoveries, you know, one of the cornerstones of the theory of general relativity is that you cannot travel and you cannot communicate faster than the speed of light, right? That's the, that's the axiom on which everything else is built. So do you think that this connection that you have when, when we're playing music is transmitted at the speed of light, slower, faster? Does it break the laws of physics? What faster. Do you think, faster. I, think faster. I, would, I would like to ask you that question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know, what I can... I know. Yeah, please tell us. I love yeah. learning. Yeah, it's a... Uh, well, well, I don't... I don't know. I'm just a, I'm just a simple astrophysicist. I don't know things, <laughs> yes. but yeah. I mean, it is a it, it is a remarkable um, 
it is a it is something that I think quite a bit about because um, you know the when you go to a big concert the cheap tickets right where you go to the absolute back part of the um, of the stadium and you you kind of watch the band from afar right are cheap for a reason I think that one of the things that gets lost when you're not close to the band is that there is a discrepancy between what you see and what you hear right and and when that right when there's a difference in the transmission of of those signals you kind of feel you don't feel as connected to the to the performance right as you do when you're right there right so i think that you know there's there's certainly three things going on right there's the there's what you see, there's what you hear, and then there's what you feel. And, uh, you know, I think that I would, I would be uh, in, in interest of not, you know, losing my job as a, as a professor of Caltech, I will, I will, you know, prevent myself from, uh, you know, speculating about faster than light travel. Uh, but, you know, it's certainly something that I think uh, probably gets transmitted at least, right, at the speed of light. Yes. <laughs> um, what about our thoughts? Uh, don't they move at the speed of light? No, no. So I, I once, you know, worked with a colleague of mine from University of Michigan to try to figure out what the time scale is for free will, right? right? Because this is a, you know, a fundamental question that I'm very interested in, right? Mm -hmm. We're all, we're all fundamentally right? Machines, right? There's their electrical signals being, you know, fired right now in, in all of our brains. And if you look at a very mechanistic view of a human being, you might convince yourself that there is no, there's nothing, you know, interesting there. It's just a little circuit. It's just a biological circuit. And yet we exhibit free will. I'm a genuine believer in the notion of free will. But I think that free will must be a emergent quantity it must be something that comes out from the complexity of having a lot of pieces that are individually simple but working together in a way that yields true complexity so we tried to do this calculation uh, and i know that i'm going on an academic tangent mm -hmm. uh, but you know this is this is just the cost of the cost of doing business right mm -hmm. Uh, but the time scale we came up with is sort of a fraction of a second, right? So you have free will on a time scale, you know, longer than a fraction of a second. But I think that when you're talking about 0.1, you know, 0.2 seconds, something like that, it's all reactive, right? It's all the, you know, your, um, your kind of uh, unconstrained part of your, your brain doing the calculations. Mm -hmm. um, and but it's a it, I'm glad you asked that question because it's uh, it's not clear when we play music which part of it we play it with right we certainly compose it with the free will part of our brain but when we play it is it do we think about it or is it instinctive I think it's instinctive once right. you know how to do it like once you've really right. internalized the music right uh, right. So totally yes yeah yeah um, so I want to come back for a second to this frequency business that mm -hmm. you guys are both resonating with and Eduardo right Hillary mentioned that you like the golden ratio right you, you think there's something important about the golden ratio what is it very important because the golden ratio is no other than um, a description or, or a um, way to, this, to describe how we are made biologically. Mm -hmm. Our DNA or all cells are made in for that, that mathematical equation, which was discovered by the Greeks and the, right. all the great temples. And then in the 12th century Fibonacci, made it into even numbers, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34. Mm -hmm. And it all comes to the fact that you don't divide um, 
a, a space in, in the center by one third of. For example, we all at the moment in one third of the space. Look at me, I'm not in the middle, neither is Chucky. See, and, and you're, you move now, but you were be, before a little bit to your right, Constantine. Um, why? Because that oh. is exa there, exact, yeah. exactly. And why? The concept of beauty, we see, we consider beauty when it is arranged you know, in the way our brain thinks. If I always say that if you go to a very far away village and you mm -hmm. go to a, a bar or restaurant and you see that they nail um, something to hang on a hat, the possibilities that that nail and that to put that hat or that coat are in the in the Fibonacci series and the golden ratio are 99%. And whoever did it wasn't aware of it, but our taste goes with it. So if we have that taste, that taste, and we resonate with that, when you compose music or when you make art like Leonardo da Vinci did, right? Mm -hmm. Or when you write a film, when you actually edit a film, if you put the, the structure within those coordinates, the, the human brain connects with it. It's not I compose with it, Exactly. I simply organize it in that way. And mm -hmm. I'm not the only one. Look, Johann Sebastian Bach did it all the time. People say they did it intuitively. He, he did it intuitively, mm -hmm. even more so than Bartok. He did it consciously. But it's all to do with finding ways to connect with our audience in a much more direct way. And, um, Fascinating. Yeah. Yes, fabulous. Fabulous. yeah, I mean, it, you're... you're um, Thoughts on breaking of, you know, breaking of the symmetry, right? Of not having it in the middle. I mean, it goes back to certainly something that, uh, you know, I think about quite a bit, which which is the fact that the whole the reason we exist is because of symmetry breaking in the early universe. Yeah. See, if the early universe was made with the exact same amount of matter and antimatter. Right, we those two things annihilate by creating energy. Right, if you take an electron and the positron, which is a positively charged electron, and have them meet, they will become light, and that's that. And so the whole reason that matter exists is because of uh, symmetry breaking, this violation of uh, this notion. And so you know, it's I I think it's really really interesting how you. Uh, view this as an innate, this is an innate, an innate process, innate you know, feature in which we find uh, beauty. And, and not, I should say, yeah, go ahead. It's not in the choice of notes of the of the music itself. It's how the music gets structured, so, because otherwise it would become, as we discussed earlier, a very really rational thing that has no emotion. No, it's where things are placed, and that's why you go to the. Chapel, 16 Chapel and all these fantastic uh, 12th century works, they're mm -hmm. all fabulous, but they were created with a, that a structure. So, well, expand on that a bit. What do you mean by structure? Well, the Fibonacci, which is, as I said, you put your right perfect and in the in the anti-symmetry of the square. Look, you are in one third, so is Chucky, and so am I here. Like, uh -huh. If I were to be seated here in the middle, it's not so much fun, but here, is perfect harmony, you see? It's breaking the symmetry, but in, mm -hmm. in something which of course it makes all sense. And is our brain, like the nail on the wall with the hat, is that the one that decides that? If our brain was made differently or body differently or DNA differently, mm -hmm. then we would be obeying to a different law of, of symmetry. It's because okay. that's the way we are made, you see? All that's right. so fascinating. All right. I totally it is agree. a fascinating, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Chucky. I said I totally agree with it. <laughs> Unless you're a newscaster, you need to be in the middle. <laughs> I mean, imagine how much better news would be if there were a third, uh, right? I mean, I think that yes. we just created a, a whole, I don't know, a trillion dollar idea maybe for a new news channel. Our whole, you know, value proposition is going to be newscasters not in the center, not in the in, center. Infinite viewership. I love it. Give us, um, a, give us some room to breathe, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. So, 
we will go pretty soon to the audience questions. But before wow. we do, okay, I want to, you know, briefly touch on where we started, which was that this notion and where we, you know, have been going all along of a mechanistic divide everything straight through the center, you know, let's full, be fully algorithmic about writing music, about reading music, right? You both clearly think, and I think I agree with you, that this is something that can be entertaining in the moment and will have no long-term value. So can a soul, right? What you say, you know, putting a in soul into a piece of music, can that process be learned, right? Can a machine, uh, an arbitrarily complex machine learn to emulate it well enough that it tricks the, the human being into? Maybe, but it's uh, underlying trick the people. When you trick mm -hmm. somebody to feel something, then what you're saying is, I'm tricking you with something that's not real, but okay. let's, let's pretend that it is. Music is, is uh, like I said, like a language of the soul. I don't think it can ever be faked. I don't think the soul can ever be faked. Uh, maybe very close to, to it, mm -hmm. but, but I doubt that it can ever be truly organic because it's not. It's a machine. The, the, and the difference is also with, with how people will react to what you're doing. So if you take, you put into the computer a groove, a drum groove of, of two bars or something that you like, and then you tell, they'll tell the computer to create a loop so it will repeat for seven or eight minutes, you're already, I mean, it might sound great and people will dance to it and everything, but where is the energy? Is the energy only in the first two bars where you created something and then the rest was just repeated automatically by something? Um, I, I believe that those kind of productions are lacking the soul. You know? Okay. Yeah. I'm guessing you don't hang out at the club too much. I listen. To, I listen to everything. Uh, I'm. I'm a very fortunate man to have three daughters, from totally three different generations, <laughs> and I follow all of them. And myself, I enjoy all kind of music. Yeah. I don't. I don't sit and search for the soul in anything, but I feel it when it's there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. And Eduardo, what do you think? Right. Exactly. The in same. fact. Exactly the same thing. So, so yeah. let me let me read a let me read a poem to you that was written by a, uh, um, you know, well, actually, that will that was written maybe by a human, maybe it was written by a machine. You tell me. It says though their love was forbidden, they found a way to keep it hidden. They snuck around behind everyone's back and hoped their secret would not crack, but eventually it all came out like a fallen feather. And they were forced to face the music, told they were not meant to be together, but they still loved each other all the same. What do you guys think? Good or bad? Uh, I think it's beautiful. beautiful. I, yeah, I think it's good. Uh, I, I couldn't tell if it was created by an AI or a uh, person because it's words, it's not music. Interesting. But even, okay, but even if it was, the way Constantine read it, is what makes a soul of it. That's of what it is. Of course, of course. See, that's of what it is. Course. So, so this yeah. is where, where I was uh, I was going to go with this. So, you know, of course, music creation, right, is undeniably something that is wonderful when when you put that, that energy, when you put yourself into mm -hmm. it. But, you know, the fact is, not all, uh, only a small fraction of the music we hear, I think, today uh, has that, has that element in it so you know can can some of that be injected be interpreted right by and to be by the way the ai wrote this i i, I had to write a bunch of poems earlier today and yeah. th this one actually i thought was most of them were really bad 
and didn't rhyme and didn't make any sense. But this one had like a Romeo and Juliet uh, almost sense to it. So I, I kind of like this one. Uh, so it's clearly still has a long way to go. But, you know, I, I feel like I, I really agree with you that, you know, even you know, as we as we continue down uh, this world of, of that is being progressively mechanized, it is so important to retain the human element. And uh, I've, I've really, really enjoyed this conversation with you guys. I have a lot of, you know, really, uh, I think I have more questions, obviously, than I have, uh, than I had at the beginning, which is always a good sign. But I think it's important that we, that I stop asking them. And instead, we switch to some questions from the audience. And uh, the, let's see, Helen texted me that um, Achmiel from grade seven asked the following question. Some people dream in color. Do you dream in music? The question for me? Both, both of you. Do either of you dream in music? Do both of you dream in music? A lot. Of, a lot. There's a lot of music, not only in my dreams, but when I'm awake too. It's almost mm -hmm. like a soundtrack that's constantly playing stuff. And, okay. and from time to time, if it's something that really touches me, I will stop to, to wonder what it is and go and try and find it on the piano because it's something that I feel I should develop. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I hear music. There's a soundtrack to everything. And some is like silly comedies and some are no. dramas and some are a little sad, but mostly are very happy. Okay, okay. Eduardo, what about you? Do you dream in music? Absolutely. In fact, I remember yesterday night, I was dreaming of a music that I have to finish off for the 4th of July concert here in, in Miami mm -hmm. at, at, to celebrate the 4th of July with, with um, Major Suarez. And I um, was finishing the piece and I was in during the evening before going to bed, I was kind of concerned because I didn't find a solution and I had dreamt a solution. Wow. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, I, all the solution was there, and when I woke up, thank God I remembered, <laughs> and I have it now. I don't think I would have been able to to create it, compose it, mm -hmm. if it wasn't because I dreamt it. Beautiful. I yeah, I only dreamed the the E, like low string E note, perfect metronome, dun 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 dun, dun the entire night. That's all. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Do you change key or do you stay with the same key? Just same key, never, never change. It's, per it's perfect. Dividing just, it in half. Yeah. Just no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, of course. But that is that is a surprisingly large fraction of metal, right? Metal, a lot of metal is so, so conservative. But moving on to the next question, speaking of metal, uh, Carrie from grade eight asks, who are your musical idols? Uh, Mine, I, first, of course, come to mind is the Beatles because mm -hmm. I started playing guitar because of the Beatles. I taught myself how to play the guitar so I can learn the chords for mm -hmm. every one of their songs. Um, and it remained through the years until now. Paul McCartney is a, is a very big influence. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so Paul, Paul McCartney. Yes. Yeah, I mean, if he if he keeps going, one day he's gonna make it in this business, right? Uh, he's just uh, he's just gonna make it, right? The, um, the music of Bernstein from West Side Story is one of my utmost favorite, and uh, okay. there's I I like a lot of music from different kind of genres, but uh, oh, Paul McCartney. Okay. Speaking of Paul McCartney, cannot read and write music either, and I think I mentioned that before. Yeah, it's all just, yeah. yeah. Pretty incredible. Yeah, hasn't quite stopped him from uh, no. writing a good, yeah, writing a couple of good ones. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Eduardo, what about for you? That's a very difficult question because I think I can tell you the ones I don't like. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like so, I like so many composers. So, uh, from yeah. the classical Brahms, Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, and from the non so classical, the Beatles. I adore the Beatles. Yeah. Yeah. So. I admire Shuki Levy so much too. Oh, <laughs> okay. So, so, so it's, um, and that's the beauty of it all because we can, what I can tell you is I, 
I, for me, there is no different kind of music. It's only two kinds, the good music and the bad music. That's right. Uh -huh. yes. That's all. That's so cool. you choose. And even, I'm not saying by that, uh, from uh, the, this very modern stuff uh, is not good. No, uh, I like all these new rhythms mm -hmm. too. But if they have yeah. soul, if they don't have soul, forget it. Yes. Right. right, right. Absolutely. No, I, I mean, look, I think, uh, you know, yeah, I, I completely, uh, you know, have agree with both of you, had a very similar experience. I fell in love with the Beatles when I was my first you know, consciously started actively seeking out music. I think I was about eight. I remember I was sick one day and uh, in particular it was, you know, uh, the With the Beatles album. Uh, and I stayed home and I remember the first track hearing like, you know, it won't be long, yeah, yeah, right? And it was like, you know, brain rewire. Yes. And there've been a few times in my life where listening to, uh, you know, listening to music, right? It feels like, you know, something drastic happens and you're not the same person anymore. I actually had a similar, you know, experience. I remember the first time I heard, you know, listening to Metallica, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I just thought to myself, how, you know, how can, how do they play like that? It's almost like, it's almost like playing drums on the guitar, right? right. And uh, so, so really, really fascinating. If you want to know how Metallica does it, go back to the Deep Purple. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. No, Deep, Deep Purple, um, right, definitely pioneers, uh, pioneers of uh, the genre. Now, uh, I want to ask, get to a couple more questions, mm -hmm. which are, what are your processes? How do you compose it? Are you in the studio at home, on the beach, everywhere? At the beach. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, with me, it's different. Um, in most cases, it's because I hear it already. I start hearing music. So mm -hmm. whatever instrument is next to me, I will reach for it and, and start you know, thinking about it. But uh, it's, it's, really, it's really different. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm never in a panic to run. Actually, Sometimes I hear something that I like and I purposely don't even record it on my iPhone. Mm -hmm. because I'm thinking to myself, this sounds really good. I need to think about it. Is it really mine or did I copy somebody? I have to think about it. And tomorrow I'll, I'll kind of work on it. And if I forgot it the next day, it means it wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. So I will, follow, yeah. I will follow up on what I remember. And, yeah. and develop it, yeah. A perspective where you're not worried that it's the last thing you're gonna write. Uh, and Eduardo, what about for you? The same, I compose in my mind all the yeah. time. Uh -huh. Yes. And, uh, yes, and the same thing as Chuck, if I, a, a tune comes to my mind and sometimes I'm not sure if it's mine or I copy it, but if right. I don't remember it, then of course, but I, also, the process of creation has something fantastic. When I composed Planet Nine for you, mm -hmm. I was inspired by the fact that you discovered Planet Nine. So there was something very mysterious there mm -hmm. in your own process, which I hooked myself into it. So that composition has very much an element of you in it, mm -hmm. whether I like it or not. I couldn't avoid it. I also was inspired by you and I wrote it for you. And somehow you communicated that music to me with this Look. another process of composition, right? Uh -huh. Right, right. Look, and, and Eduardo, it's a beautiful piece. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful piece and I could not, uh, I mean, I, I really cannot conjure a, a more perfect piece of music to represent the process and the, of, of how that hypothesis you know, through calculations, through numerical simulations came into existence. So uh, I, I know that you know this because I've told you this before, but I so, you know, I, I so deeply appreciate you, you know, putting in so much of your soul, so much of your uh, self into, into that composition. It's Thank a beautiful you. piece. Thank you, but I would also like to ask you a question now. 
doesn't Planet Nine have an element of intuition as well? Because besides all the mathematical things that when you discover, mm -hmm. what made you, I'm sure you felt that in your intuition besides of all the rational scientific methodology, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a question that comes back, it comes up generally in mathematics a lot. You know, you can't develop intuition, uh, sorry, you can't have intuition without developing it, just like with music, right? You can't develop intuition for music without learning how to play. But with math, with physics, with science, if you're doing, if you do a lot of it, after a while, you don't have to go through that process as much every time. You can actually have intuition for something. You know if something feels right. And there's no way to quantify it. No one's been able to quantify what it means to have intuition. So did, uh, you, did you feel the planet nine was there before you maybe became a rational thinking process? Uh, I mean, it, it was just like writing music. It, the two or the two came together at the same time. One did not exist without the other. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, and, and again, it's something that cannot be written down just like what you guys were talking about with, you know, the, the fundamentals of music are not the, the notes that you write down in notation on the staff, the fundamental are, are something else. And, you know, to what's interesting is that, uh, you know, Tina from seventh grade actually said something very related. Right? She said, thank you for encouraging us to go for it, even if we can't read or write music. She says, I'm dyslexic and struggle quite a bit. So what you said means a lot to me. I will go for it, which I think is fantastic. I think Tina should definitely uh, yeah. go for it because it's it's that intuition, right? That that feeling that does not cannot be separated from playing, right? Totally. Um, all right. Listen, guys. It was such a pleasure to discuss with you. I hope that we can continue this discussion, hopefully in three dimensions. You know, as soon as possible. But for the time being, I just want to say again, once again, thank you for sharing your insight, for sharing your soul. And uh, let's, you know, hand it off over back to Hillary. Sorry, I was stuck in the in mute world over here. That was so much fun and so interesting, and I loved every minute of it. It was such a unique um, point of view to hear from all of you and all of the ways that music and science and everything combines. And I absolutely loved hearing a little bit of a little piece of heavy metal in there because I always think that that's like the forgotten genre, and I just love it. It was so part of growing up in the '80s. So it was a, mm. it was just absolutely wonderful. Thank you to all three of you. Constantine, I think you should run all of the rest. Yeah, exactly. I'm a Maiden fan myself, but you know, there we go. Um, so anyway, I just want to go through some quick announcements. Um, the Genius 100 community meeting would be held on Tuesday, May 24th. So please make note of that and join us if you can. Um, we'll be getting everyone updated on all things Genius, including some of our new campaigns and um, some of our travel and some of the other things that we're cooking up over here. Um, on May 31st will be the 2022 Genius 100 Visionary Induction Ceremony, um, which will be inducting our first G100 Legacy Visionary, Goldie Hong, Academy Award winner and founder of MindUp, in honor of Genius Visionary and Spiritist, Sir Ken Robinson. I mentioned earlier um, at the beginning, of our show today that Maestro is going to be working on some wonderful music for that. So uh, really looking forward to that. And I, Maestro, I will see you tomorrow in Miami to talk more about that. Um, the New York Festival Advertising Awards is in its second year. The Genius 100 Work of Genius Inspiration Awards in partnership with the New York Festival Advertising Awards is well underway um, with submissions rolling in. Our 2022 judges are G100 Global Ambassador and famed actor James Kahn, who has stepped up into the role of chairperson of this group um, for this year, and G100 Visionaries Jose Miguel Sokoloff of Low Mullen Advertising Agency, Seema Samar, Global Women's Rights and Education Pioneer, 
and Don Tapscott, who's the founder of Blockchain, who was on one of our previous uh, G100 uh, Genius of series earlier this year, as was Seema. Um, this award was developed to honor the most impactful commercial creative work of the year, and it will be the only category this year of the festival to accept NGO and cause-related work. So keep an eye out for that. And G100 will be out and about. We're finally getting in person again after meeting in Toronto earlier this week, or Toronto, as they say it there. We're going to be globetrotting again. Um, look for us in South Florida the weekend of May 20th, and we're planning to be in Israel the week of July 25th. But there'll be more announcements to come on some in-person Genius events coming up. So for more information about anything you heard today or any of the events we have going on or anything about Genius, please go to our website and join our mailing list to get um, invited to all of our stuff or just be in touch via email with either Helen or myself. And um, I think that about does it for today. Thank you guys so much. What a wonderful show of visionary power today. And um, if anyone again has any questions, just hit us up on email or through our website or any other way you can reach us. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Take care. Bye. Bye.